All right. Just let's get started. Welcome to the Wednesday night Bible study. Great to have everyone here. Why don't we go ahead and pray? Our pastor will be back uh, this weekend, so he'll be here Sunday. But I'll be filling in tonight, so let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, uh, to um, be here and share your word and to address an important question. Lord, I pray that you would give me the sensitivity of your spirit. Lord, a heart of empathy, sympathy, Lord, as I go through this message. Um, Lord, I pray that you would use this message to impact people, Lord, not only in this room now, but in the future, on the internet, listening on a CD or watching. Lord, I pray that uh, this issue would be dealt with each of us in our own hearts, knowing that you are good in the midst of suffering. In Jesus' name, amen. So the tonight's uh, title of the message is, If God, Then Why Evil? If God, Why Evil? It's a big question, and it seems that evil doesn't really need an introduction, does it? Um, we all know what evil is. We're all experiencing it in our bodies. We've experienced it in our families. We're experiencing it in our nation. We're experiencing it in the world. And we're not just talking about horrors that are in some far off land or on the news. It's something that hits each one of us intimately. And if it hasn't hit one of us intimately, we're going to be experiencing evil or suffering at some point in our lives. And so, but at the same token, we read it in the Bible, verses like Psalm 105 that says, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So it says the Lord is good, but then we have evil and suffering in the world. We know that God is creator, so there's this conflict that can take place. I know maybe some of you have uh, maybe dealt with this question, but I know it is the number one reason that people leave the faith as Christians. And so this is what we're going to be uh, digging into tonight. So I promise you the answer will uh, not only satisfy, but transform our thinking. So, here's the question. If God exists and is loving, he would put an end to evil. If he is all-powerful, he could put an end to evil. Since evil persists, the all-loving, all-powerful God described in the Bible must not exist. Okay? That's the argument there, and it's used quite often. If God is all-loving, he would put an end so it's either that he is cruel or he is weak, is, the, is what it leaves us with in this question. Now, we're going to be looking at this question a little bit more, but this is the same question that the disciples had. Uh, if you want to turn to John chapter 9, your Bibles, John chapter 9. This was one of my favorite stories when I was a kid. It was about a blind man who was born blind. And they ask him about that. So John chapter 9, verse 1, says this. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw the man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, right off the bat, there's, there's a why, was, why is he like this? There's a sense that he shouldn't be blind. There's a sense that there's something wrong there. And then there's a sense that when we have suffering or evil happen in our lives, it's because of something we did, right? So there's all these questions that are starting, starting to stir up in their minds already. Um, you don't have to turn there if you want, don't want to, but if you like to travel through your Bibles, Mark chapter 4, verse 37. Mark 4.37 says this. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Right? So here's the God of the universe sleeping in the boat, the storm's rising, the disciples are like, don't you care that I'm suffering? Don't you care that we're almost going to die? This is another question that comes up. It's 
greatly are directly related to it. In John chapter 11, verse 21, we read something very similar to this, and that is when Martha has just lost her brother, Lazarus. And when Jesus shows up in verse 21, she says, Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would have not died. So she says, God, if you were here, if you would have done something, if you just cared, or maybe you just weren't capable of being here, he would have lived, right? So there's this aspect, but I, I don't want to sell her short and take her out of context, because in verse 22, she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she understood that he could still raise him from the dead, but there was this question that was asked by many of the disciples. It's the most important question the problem of evil is the question mark turned like a fish hook in the human heart, right? The question of evil, it grabs at us. One of my uh, favorite all-time authors of all time, which you guys know that if you've ever listened to me before, my son is named after one of his characters in one of his fiction books, C.S. Lewis. He's considered the father of modern ap apologetics. And he wrote a book in 1944, an excellent book called The Problem of Pain. And Jim Heather, or Jill Heather, Heatherly described the book as, the problem of pain answers the universal question, why would an all-loving, all-knowing God allow people to experience pain and suffering? Master Christian apologist C.S. Lewis asserts that pain is a problem because of our finite human minds selfishly believe that pain-free lives would prove that God loves us, okay? That's what the book is about. It's this one of the most masterful books written on the issue of suffering. If you have someone in your life that you know that is going through suffering and they're saying God can't exist because of evil and suffering, this is the book you give them. But at this time, C.S. Lewis was single. He hadn't been married. He was much older. But 12 years later, he married the American writer Joy Gresham, who four years later after they married in 1960 died of cancer. And after he her death, he wrote in his journal that was later published, which is called Grief Observed. And this is what he had to say in Grief Observed. Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The conclusion I dread is not, so there's no God after all. But, so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer. This is the man who's literally fought for the reality of God, and he's doubting at this point because of suffering. He continued on to say, of course, it is easy enough to say that God seems absent at our greatest need because he is absent, non-existent. But then why does he seem so present when, to put it quite frankly, we don't ask for him? That's real stuff right there, isn't it? He is broken. He just lost his wife. It was a theoretical problem before, but when it came into his own life, it became a personal problem, and it was something he had to grapple with. I, I really suggest that book, Grief Observed, because you get to see the, his transformation over his journal by the end of the book where he's put his faith back in God and the, his heart has changed. Another example is a man uh, who worked with uh, Billy Graham, Charles Templeton, that toured with a Youth for Christ in the 1930s and 40s. Up to 30,000 people a night would flock to hear the Canadian evangelist Charles Templeton, who in his heyday was more famous than his teammate at the time, Billy Graham. Thousands professed to have found salvation in Christ through Templeton's preaching. In the mid-40s, Templeton lost his faith. Lee Strobel was able to interview him shortly before he died, and there's a great book called The Case for Faith that is based upon this. And Strobel asked this question, was there one thing in particular that caused you to lose your faith in God? And this is him writing in his book. I asked at the outset. He thought for a moment. It was a photograph in Life magazine, he said. Finally, really, I said, a photograph? How so? He narrowed his eyes a bit and, took, uh, and looked off to the side as if he were viewing the photo afresh and reliving the moment. It was a picture of a black woman in Northern Africa, he explained. They were experiencing a devastating drought. She was holding her dead baby in her arms and looking up to heaven in the most forlorn expression. 
I looked at it and I thought, is it possible to believe that there is a, a loving or caring creator when all this woman needed was rain? As he emphasized the word rain, his bushy gray eyebrows shot up and his arms gestured towards he heaven as if for beckoning for a response. How could a loving God do this to that woman? He implored as he got more animated, moving to the edge of his chair. Who runs the rain? I don't. You don't. He does. Or well, that's what I thought. When I saw that photograph, I immediately knew that it is not possible for this to happen and for there to be a loving God. There was no way. Who else but a fiend could destroy a baby and virtually kill its mother with agony when all that was needed was rain? So you can see there's this devastation that took place in him just from a photo like this one. And he left his faith led hundreds of thousands of, of people to the Lord as an evangelist and left his faith because of this question. And the first thing I want to address is this, is that people really don't want an answer. Does an answer bring comfort or satisfaction to this question? No, it really doesn't, does it? Why not? Is it the diagnosis that brings comfort? What brings comfort? The hope of a cure. It's the hope of a cure that brings comfort. And someone says, well, you have cancer. That's why you're experiencing all these symptoms. You're not like, oh, oh, great. I feel so much better. Thank you for explaining me how I contracted it, how I could have lived my life differently. No, it's what can we do now? Um, as we look at human relationships, what we see is that lovers don't want explanations but presence. They just want someone to be there. The best answer we can give someone is not a not a word, but the word himself, Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. When life goes wrong, people don't need the answers of why it went wrong. They need help. That's what they need. And the only help is really found in Jesus Christ. And what people really want is someone to be with them in the suffering. And the only one that can truly be with us all the time is Jesus Christ himself. So the answer to this question really is Jesus. The answer is, is Jesus. But I believe when the heart fails, the mind is the second line of defense. And that's what I'm going to be addressing tonight. Is because many will, will ask the question as though it is just a mental block for them why they don't believe in God, but really usually it's, it's a, a blockage of the heart, right? They're, they're dealing with something, they lost somebody, and they just can't reconcile that in their heart. But there is also a mental component to this whole question, and so that's what we're going to dig in tonight, looking at the apologetic side of this question of why evil if God exists. Okay, so the question, once again, was if evil, if God exists and is loving, he would put an end to evil. If he's all-powerful, he can put an end to evil. Since evil persists, the all-loving, all-powerful God described in the Bible must not exist. Well, if God doesn't exist, then evil doesn't exist. That's our first response. If God doesn't exist, then neither can evil. The statement commits intellectual and moral suicide just by stating what it's stated already. Let's see how. Charlie Campbell says, without God, without a moral lawgiver, we would not have any objective real standards by which we might deem something to be evil. We would not be able to conclusively say kidnapping children and murdering, murdering them is evil. We could say we don't like these things, but we could not call that kind of behavior evil. It would just be a matter of opinion. Do you understand that? So if there is no God, right and wrong is mere, mere preference and choice. So it can't be called evil. It can just be called uh, something I don't like, okay? It's not evil. God, who is good, he is the one who sets the standards of good, which then gives us evil, okay? So C.S. Lewis also said this, when I was an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how did I get the idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line, right? So unless we know what right and wrong is, we can't call anything evil, okay? So it's interesting 
that if you look at pantheists, they believe God exists, but evil doesn't exist, right? And then you look at uh, atheists who believe that evil exists, but God doesn't exist, all right? So this question can't even be brought up on the basis of their worldview, okay? So the next question is, what is evil? What is evil? And this is foundational because I think I know that I did until I started reading more, had the complete wrong idea of what evil is. Because this is foundational to, explain, foundational to explaining this question about evil. So I like to use the, the skeptic and the Christian here, right? So the skeptic says, did God create evil? And then the Christian answers, no. But didn't God create everything? Yes. Is evil more powerful than God? No. And then at this point, the skeptic's like, I don't understand. And then he says, if evil is not more powerful than God, he created everything and did not create evil, then how can all three points be true? All right? So he's like, you're not making much sense yet, Christian. Evil is not a thing. Do you believe that evil is real? Yes. If it's real, then it's something, right? <laughs> the skeptic is fully confused at this point. And the Christian says, yes, it exists. But even Augustine defined evil as a real lack, a privation, a corruption of a good thing. Okay, if maybe you're losing, I've lost you at this point. Let me explain it this way. Evil can only exist in something that's good. Without something good, it cannot exist. Evil is not a substance in and of itself, okay? So what is evil? A good example would be like a hole in a ring. What is the hole in the ring? Nothing, right? It's the lack of the ring filling that space. If you look at, if we had a complete hole in a ring, there would be no ring. So there would be no, there would be no evil if we're looking at that, right? Okay. If you have a tree, it has rot in a tree. What is a rot? rot in a tree. It's nothing, right? It's, and if you have a fully rotted tree, you no longer have a tree, okay? In the same way, if you have a wound on your arm, a po person cannot be fully wounded because they're no longer a person anymore. Does that make sense? So evil is the privation or the corruption of something that's good. Evil can only exist in that which is good, okay? And you cannot have something that's fully evil, Okay, so that's important to understand as we move forward with what is evil. Evil is the lack of God. As we look at the example of light and darkness, you can get brighter and brighter, but you, can, you have an, a, an absolute darkness ele, uh, point. Okay, so uh, hell is the absence of God or the corruption of what God has created. Um, and so evil is not a thing that God created, and it is not a force that coexisted with God before time, okay? Before, uh, before Satan and mankind, evil did not exist. It had the ability to exist, but it did not exist. So what is evil? To put it very simply, it is the corruption of something good, and it can only exist in something that is good. All right, so then the next question is, well, where does evil come from then? Where is this coming from, this evil? Evil is chosen from free will creatures, okay? From free will creatures. There's a book, if I don't satisfy your questions tonight, that gets a lot deeper into this. It's called If God, Why Evil by Norman Geisler. I'd encourage you to read it. It's a really easy read, and it really tackles this issue better than I'm even doing tonight. So James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So where does evil come from? It comes from free will creatures, like the angels and like ourselves, right? And what is evil? It's the corruption of something good. And how did that corruption of good start? Well, we know that it started with Satan first, right? And what was Satan's great sin? Pride, 
And what was his pride? That he thought he could be like God. Evil starts with not letting God be God. That's where it all starts from. Even think about Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. They thought that they could be like God. And that's the real sin that took place, the pride. It's when we remove ourselves as finite beings from the all-powerful all God, okay? So that's how evil came into the world. Evil is choosing anything less than absolute goodness, and that is created by free will creatures, okay? So where did evil come from? It came from free will creatures. The Bible makes that very clear. But then there's another question that comes up, and I get this question a lot teaching youth. Well, couldn't God created people without the ability to do evil? That's a great question, yeah. It's the next question that logically follows. Stopping evil means stopping creatures who do evil. Think about it this way, is um, I, I, the question was asked, well, why couldn't God just not have created Hitler, right? And I had a, an apologist here um, a couple months ago with the youth group, and he answered and he said, okay, so he didn't create Hitler. So then the next evil person would maybe be Stalin, and you go down the list, right? And so what level of evil does he choose not to, to create someone? Because you realize that somewhere down that list, if we had a ranking of evil, we fall in the rank of evil, choosing to live against God's standards. So who does he choose not to create? Because the reality is we're all free will creatures who have chosen evil. Therefore, he would have to choose not to create you. Well, you're thinking, well, maybe he could have just made it so that I didn't choose evil anymore. Well, stopping, what well, forcing people to freely believe is a contradiction in terms. As many young men have discovered, no matter how persuasive one is, the other person is always free to refuse your marriage proposal. That is the way it is in a free world. The problem is that all do not want to be saved. That is to say, God is willing to save all, but not all are willing to be saved. Oh, one of the things I want to add to this, too, is nothing is not better than something, right? Some people think, well, why did God allow evil? Because there's so much evil in the world, and we can focus on the evil that we forget all the good that has come from free will, right? God, in all of his infinite knowledge, knew that it was worth giving us free will, that there was going to be enough good that would come out of it, choosing Jesus Christ himself, being able to be saints in him, that it was worth it to give us free will that we might choose him, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have given us free will. He knew that he was able, that he, that the good would come out of it. Every step is a potential fall, but no one would insist we should st uh, not learn to walk. Every day people get in cars accidents, but that doesn't mean we don't drive our car, right? People have children with the possibility of having them do wickedness, right? And still we have kids knowing they might not be Christians one day. We would fall in that same category of why didn't God just not create people that were going to do evil? Um, well, we could have not had kids if we wanted to be a part of that too, right? So we're all evil, but God knew that there could be good that would come out of it, which is us becoming his children. But then the next question is this, and I think it's uh, a great question is why does God still allow evil to exist? Why does God still allow evil to exist? Oops. Let's see. Oh, great. Let's see, I just lost my slideshow. I pushed the wrong button. Okay. All right. Well, you guys just ignore the screen behind me. You get to enjoy Half Dome. All right. So, why does God still allow evil to exist? An argument against God. If God is all good, he would defeat evil. If God is all-powerful, he could defeat evil, but evil is not defeated. Therefore, no God exists. Okay, that's the argument against God. But as a Christian, the rebuttal goes like this. If there's an all-good God, he wants to defeat evil. If there's an all-powerful God, he can defeat evil, but evil is not yet destroyed. Therefore, evil will one day be defeated. We're told in Revelation chapter 21, 4, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older things have passed away. Isn't that awesome? 
We know as Christians, the reason that evil has not been defeated is it's not yet defeated. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 with me. 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 3. It says, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jump down to verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it says in the last days, people are going to be like, yeah, well, your God still hasn't done it. Evil still exists. And it says, understand this, the reason that evil still exists is because God still allows evil people to exist because he loves them and wants them to turn from their wickedness so that they might be reformed and changed and regenerated. And so that is why evil still exists in the world. And so one day he will put an end to evil. But then the next question is, what is the purpose of evil? Here again, further study has shown that the unexplained is not necessary, the unexplainable. Likewise, that we don't know a good purpose for some suffering does not mean that there is none, right? Sometimes we might never know why we went through the suffering we went through, but it doesn't mean that that suffering didn't have a purpose. A lot of times we look for the purpose, like who got saved when I got sick? You know, what change did it make in me? You know, we want to know every single time something bad happens. Okay, what good maybe came out of that? But we might not always know. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't a purpose for it and that God's not going to do something awesome in that. Norman Geisler said, Evolutionists once claimed that there were some 180 vestigial organs or organs without function left over from our animal ancestry over the last century or so the list has shrunk to, shrunk to six. What he's saying is, at one point, scientists thought, oh, there's like 180 organs we just don't need in our body. I thought, wow, there's 180 organs in my body? That's crazy. But, and, and, but now we, there's about six organs that we're still scratching our head, like, I don't know what these functions, the functions of these organs are. We found they had a purpose. In the same way, when we get to heaven, we're going to see that maybe we don't really understand that. Um, even though we might not always know the why, at least we know why we don't know why, because we are limited in our own knowledge. God isn't, and he wants us to trust him. Further, we, don't, we do not only know why we do not know why, but we know the one who does know why, an infinitely good God. One of the most astounding things to me is, and I think one person that could question this is Johnny Erickson Tata, or Johnny Erickson Tata uh, recently diagnosed with cancer, after being paralyzed and just suffering after suffering, but God has used her in such a powerful way. One of the most amazing women. And she said, what a mistake to think that I would ever be able to complete the whole puzzle of suffering. For wisdom is more than just seeing our problems through God's, God's eyes. It's also trusting him even when the pieces don't seem fit. One of the things I forgot to do, but I was going to do tonight, so I'll just tell you what I was going to do. It was gonna be really profound but we'll just pretend like it's happening right now. But when I usually teach this message, everyone that walks in, I give them a piece of a puzzle, right? And you look at the piece of the puzzle, and you look at the shape of it, and you see the colors on it, and you, you check out that piece of the puzzle. And then I go around the room and I ask, what do you think the puzzle is, right? What do you think it's a picture of? And then I say, you can even collect, get together and put all your pieces together, and you tell me what is the puzzle uh, going to show and what's the going to be um, depicting, you would never figure it out from a little piece of a puzzle, right? Even when we put our puzzle pieces together, we don't have the full picture. But that's the same way it is with God. We only see this much of our life in the light of eternity, and we just have no clue. 
We have no clue how all the puzzles pieces fit together. A great verse that speaks to this is Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For instance, the greatest Christians in history seem to say that their suffering ended up bringing them closest to God. So this is the best thing that could happen, not the worst. Think about that. If the best thing in life is that you get closer to God, if the worst thing in the world happens to you, it's the best thing if it draws you closer to God. I mean, that's really hard to swallow, isn't it? Losing a child, losing a loved one, those things that are just unimaginable, but it brings you to your knees and closer to God like anything else, that's the best thing that could ever happen. I don't that's a perspective that's hard to get, but that's the perspective of what God's word tells us. Well, what is the answer to all evil, all pain, and suffering? Jesus is the answer to all evil, pain, and suffering. Turn to one of my favorite passages in all the Bible, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This is one that you should have highlighted in your Bible if you don't have it highlighted yet. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 37. Jesus is the answer to evil because he con conquered it on the cross. It says, Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He paid the price so that we could be close to him. And we are conquerors through him. And so no matter what comes our way, we are more than conquerors. Jesus is the answer to pain, evil, and suffering because he's experienced the pain too. Philippians 2, 7 through 8. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Johnny Erickson Tata also said, God's like a father, doesn't just give advice, he gives himself. He becomes the husband to the grieving widow. He becomes the comforter to the barren woman. He becomes the father of the orphan. He becomes the bridegroom to the single person. He is the healer to the sick. He is the wonderful counselor to the confused and to the depressed. He becomes the answer. He becomes our healer. He is what we need. I can give you an answer of why things are the way they are, but the answer, the, the, the fulfillment that you need is in Jesus Christ himself. He is the answer to suffering because he has put death in his grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. For the sting... For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Randy Alcorn in his book, If God is Good, he says, In looking for answers, I beheld a God who says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering, Exodus 3, 7. I found great comfort in hearing God speak of a time when he, could, when he could bear his people's misery no longer. I revel in God's emphatic promise that he will make a new heaven where he will come down to live with us, in which he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Above all, in this process, I've seen Jesus. He says, in the process, I have realized that I have a God that says I could bear their suffering no longer. And understand, there's going to come a point where God will say, I can bear your suffering no longer. I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, and I'm going to heal you, and I'm going to wipe away every tear, every pain, and make all things right. I'm going to make all things sad untrue. I'm going to turn this world right back side up. Everything's going to be made right again. 
Well, then another question comes, well, then why does he allow eternal suffering? The next question might be, if God, then why hell? Right? If God, why hell? Some of our major cults stemmed out of this question, right? They couldn't handle this. And, you know, I don't really think any of us should be able to handle the reality of hell. It should break our hearts and make us sick. I think just to function, a lot of times I um, marginalize and I, I bury it. It's like in my subconscious somewhere that the reality of some of the people I love are going to hell. It's just too, too devastating to really think about. But the question is, is if God is so loving, why would he allow people to, to be tortured, to be in agony for all time and all eternity? It's a hard question to answer, and I don't know if I'll justify it. I encourage you to read this book. There's another great book by Francis Chan called Erasing uh, Hell that also answers this question. But here's some things to look at. Hell is God's justice for sin. Anything less than hell would not be justice. We have an all-good God, and we know that he's perfectly just. So if he made hell the punishment for our sins, then we know it's just, because he is just. Norman Geisler said in his book, God guarantees an advanced ultimate victory over evil. However, unless there is a hell, there is no final victory over evil. For what frustrates good is evil. The wheat and the tares cannot grow together forever. Greg Kokel said this in Tactics. He said, Those who are often quick to object that, that God isn't doing enough about evil in the world, statements like, a good God wouldn't let this happen, are often, quick, often equally quick to complain when God puts his foot down. A loving God would never send anyone to hell. God appears indifferent to wickedness. His goodness is challenged. Yet if he acts to punish sin, his love is in question. You see that? A lot of times people are like, how can God, a loving God, judge people the way he does? Then the other question is, why does he allow evil and suffering in the world? Do you see how those are contradictory statements? Because the reality is, is people complain when he decides to finally judge evil, and then they complain when he allows, uh, and he's long-suffering. God is just, and he is long-suffering, and he will bring all to justice in the right time. Well, why is hell so bad? It doesn't seem fair. I don't think we realize how bad sin is. And because we don't realize how bad sin is, hell seems so bad. But if we fully understood how bad sin was, we would understand why hell is that bad. And I think the only thing that has come close to helping me understand how bad sin is, is to realize what it took to pay for sin, right? The Son of God coming to earth as a man and spilling his precious blood. That's how precious the payment was. That makes me realize how bad the debt was. And then it makes me realize how, how, much, how uh, drastic the punishment for that debt, ne debt needs to be. It's only the cross that helps me make sense of why hell has to be so bad. Well, I believe hell is in a real place. Well, if we as Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross, why the cross? Why the cross if there is no hell, right? Because it's really not that bad of a punishment if we just die and cease to exist. He came to save us from something. He came to save us from something. Why does a God of love end up sending people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. People choose it by not accepting Jesus. And one of the things that is interesting that many scholars believe is that that hell will actually be just and that depending upon your rejection of Christ and what you've done in this life will be different levels of punishment in hell. It'll all still be hell, but different levels is what some scholars believe. But John 3, 16 speaks to this. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world. Not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. <clears throat> there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. So it's them not believing that condemns them. Jesus paid the price for everyone's sin. <clears throat> it's as if people are floating down a river 
heading to a waterfall. And Jesus is there in the water just saying, here, grab my hand, grab my hand. And as people pass by, and then he's down the river again, grab my hand, grab my hand, grab my hand. And people are like, no, I'm good. I'm going to swim to shore. I'm going to take care of myself. Or I don't believe you're there. They're going to face the waterfall one day. But we can't forget that one day all this suffering in the world is temporal and one day it will be a distant memory. The hope of heaven. If you're still in Romans chapter 8, look at verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. All the suffering, all the bad stuff is not to be compared with how good God is going to be and how good heaven is going to be. That's a big statement because it gets pretty dark here, doesn't it? That just is a beautiful picture of how good heaven is going to be. C.S. Lewis said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. I love that. That if there's things in this life that I cannot satisfy, it means that, that I just haven't got to the place I need to be to be satisfied, and that is in the presence of God himself. C.S. Lewis also said, there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our hearts of hearts we have desired anything else. <laughs> really, that all of the desires we've ever had is just a longing to be home with Jesus Christ himself. Heaven is so much better than all the best riches of earth can ever offer. One of my favorite books is by D.L. Moody called Heaven, and he says this, Gold is gold that is mere dross dug up out of the earth does not satisfy man. Neither do the honor and praise of other men. The human soul wants something more than that. Heaven is the only place to get it. No wonder that the angels who see God all the time are so happy. I just want to tell you this. When you get to heaven, it will all make sense as a believer. And if you're not a believer and you don't know Christ, understand this, you'll only find the answer in Jesus. You'll only find the answer in Jesus. And if you continue to live a life without Jesus as the answer, it won't make any sense. It won't make any sense. Until then, we have a choice. Will you make life make you bitter or better? Will you grow or will you fall away? And I, I think it's sad to see where Charles Templeton ended up, but I think it's awesome to see where C.S. Lewis ended up. That he struggled through it for over a year, just broken, questioning God. But in the end, he turned it all around. He gave his heart back to the Lord and said, where can I go? Where can I go? But where you are, Lord, you have all the answers. It's only in God you'll find the answers. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to share this important um, answer, which is you. You are the answer, simply put. In you we find peace, in you we find hope. Thank you so much for all that you've done in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Any added comments, questions? Yeah, um, he wrote a book called Farewell to God. And when C.S. Lewis saw him, it was a couple months before he died. And so the words that I just read were, were a couple months before he died. So it's possible that he turned his heart right around. Um, the whole term, once saved, only saved, is um, a theological question that has debate, been debated in the church. Um, I've liked the approach that we've taken in Calvary Chapel, that we believe our faith is is sure in him but don't risk it because we not because the bible it speaks to things like you can lose your salvation you find both in the bible you find that we our faith can never be taken away from us and on the other hand you you see that you can lose your faith um so i i know i know people have different positions i think god is a loving god and i don't think he would force anyone to be with him that didn't want to be with him. That's my personal take on it, but... You know, there's a lot of us that live a Christian life, quote-unquote, but we never get off ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the thing that was... A couple, a couple experiences in my life that have been very bold. I've had more than a couple, few, 200 million in my life, but, but one was when my son died well, almost 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and I was very bitter at God, but I realized it was for his good. And not only his good, but my good. And I learned
Yeah. I go along with that one hundred percent. But the yeah, totally. realization of where I stand with God. Mm. And I mean I was a Christian for thirty almost thirty five years when I went through this and, and when I came out he gave me a whole different perspective yeah. in my relationship with him. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's that's a good important distinction because I was using all three terms suffering, evil, pain, and the same because that's where the unbeliever would use them in all the three categories. So thank you make, for making that distinction because it is true. There's evil, which is is the lack of following God. It's the pride. It's the it's sin, and then we have suffering, which is a result of that evil, which we we know that we have suffering and pain in the world because of evil. So yeah, that's but a good I distinction. Would go back to Job. Yeah. 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 Job is a great example. Uh, Steve. I, I would really encourage you, if you guys have, weren't here when Steve went through the book of Job, to go on the website because at that time when he was going through Job, he had been diagnosed with his prostate cancer, and so he was going through the suffering. It was just really a really well, it was a precious time in the body of Christ here at the Christian Center when Steve taught those messages. That reminded me of that, so yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. Man, I didn't even teach Hebrews 6, and you had to bring that passage up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that's a good, that's a good question, because that's one of those, that's why I'm never going to teach Hebrews ever. But anyway, um, I think the answer is, is if they stay in that thinking, that's not going to save them, because the book was written to Hebrews, and it's talking to them about going back to the judicial law. And so the answer to that would be that if they choose to try to use Judaism plus Christ, to get back to Christ, it's not going to save them because they're crucifying Christ again. But if it's Jesus Christ plus nothing, then they'll be saved. So they can repent from their legalism and from their wayward ways of trying to follow the law. It's interesting because when we think of that verse, we think about um, carnal Christians, but that verse is really speaking to more legalistic Christians, those who've added to the work of Christ, who think that their good works will save them, which I can think of certain... um, faiths that fall under that category that think i'm going to do this 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 and this and say this prayer and that's gonna it's gonna if i do all the right things then god's gonna accept me but that's not what the bible teaches so yeah and i think it does speak to that a little bit because I think once you've been a Christian and then there has to be a great delusion that comes over you to not be a Christian again. Does that make sense? And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But to fall away from the Lord, there has to become a lie to cover all that truth. Because someone who's already in the lie, you know, they don't know anything better. But, you know what I'm saying? It's that. So I see that that's why it makes it harder. But what's also makes it better is we know that the, the word of God does not return void and that God will use it. One of the most awesome things for me is being a youth pastor. I've been doing it for 10 years now. And you know, so many of the kids, they walk away from the Lord. They don't continue to be Christians. But being, doing it for 10 years is they come back time and time again. And people are like, who is in Bible college? (laughs) Who is walking with the Lord? You know, it's just amazing. We know that God can do amazing work. So we'll be praying for that. Yeah, see? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, th- those ones, yeah. Any other comments or questions that you guys want to add? Yes, Jim. God has got this whole thing figured out. And it's, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. God wants us to be saved, but he's not going to force us to be saved. Mm. So he sent his son to pay the price for our sin that we, by putting our faith and trust him, we are saved. We're not lost anymore. When, when God created us, he created us in three phases. Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. That's what he told Nicodemus. You must be born again. 
Yeah. 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 I, one of my favorite quotes is by C.H. Uh, Spurgeon that I had in my other notes when I teach on hell. And it says, if sinners be damned, let them step over and leap over our bodies getting there. That we do not, we do not let one go unprayed for or unwarned. Because it says in Romans chapter 10, how will they not know unless someone tells them? And so the, the question is, is what about, what about all those people that haven't heard? And then the question is, yeah, Christian, what about all those people that haven't heard? So that's in our, God put us, gave us the stewardship. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. That's a commandment. And so that's our role as believers to tell people. That's why we call ourselves evangelicals. Um, so that's important. It's an important thing because God is good. God is good. And that's why I wanted to share this message because I know it's a stumbling block because it can, can feel like, man, if God, is, if God is good, then why am I going through this? And I've seen some of the strongest believers be rocked, and I pray that I am building upon the rock so that when that day comes for myself that I'm found firm, grounded in him. And so you guys are a great example to me. So thank you so much. Um, Pastor Steve will be back this Sunday, and we'll be back next Wednesday. And we won't start going to... Um, once a month till the month of June. So we'll have all the Wednesdays through May. All right. Thank you so much for coming.